mission trip. First ever um of our college classes to have a hundred percent going on a mission trip. So we're super excited about that. Um, but in light of going out, we always gotta remember where we're coming from, what's happening as we're leaving, and what we're to take with us. Um, this past year, our church has changed. I mean, it has changed in massive ways. And because of the way the way we do missions needs to flow out of the way we do church. So the kind of words we use are like our missiology, which is the way we do missions and ministry, needs to flow out of our ecclesiology, the way we do church. So we get this microcosm of time with you, this little bit of time for a few months, to give you this experience of getting prepared to be sent out. So you're going, but when you go somewhere, you're also abiding. We're talking about that some today. And then, once again, you have to go. In some ways, right now, you're living a life, a sent life here at Celebration. But even in a sent life, you have to stop, put down roots, and abide. You can't just always be looking to the next thing. The people that do that, they get really frustrated because they're always trying to get to the next thing, the next level. When I get that church job, when I run that, when I start that church, whatever it might be. Um, so while this is happening, it's a time of transition for you. Even while you're transitioning, our church is going through transitions. So last time I was with you, that was the first week of school this semester. We talked a bit about catching and carrying revival. I have some great notes. I was actually, um, I totally saw somebody's notes, and I took a picture. <coughs> who are those, by the way, from the college? Everyone knows. <laughs> so everyone knows who's doing that. But uh, I'm like, um, I was thinking, someone listen. Um, but remember last time I go, you're sent. You're responding to God's saying, go out. You're representing, you're representing our church, your church, uh, to an area where there are principalities and strongholds. In that, Jesus needs to increase, and you need to carry revival. Great job. That was awesome. So um, I couldn't have taught it any better. So, um, so a couple things today. You know, what has happened here this year? Because as you get ready to take off, you're not taking off from like a stationary one geographical like Jacksonville Naval Air Station. You're leaving from an aircraft carrier. You're taking off from something that's moving. And when you get back, you'll still be moving. You can understand the, the, um, the illustration there. So what has happened here this year? What what paradigms have been in operation within our church that have changed? Um, it's important for you to know this. It's not just important for you to go on a mission trip. It's important for you to, again, represent what's happening here and what has happened in our church um, to the extent that we try to spread out as many of you from our college as possible across as many trips as possible so you can be a presence, a representative of what's happening at the closest to the heart of the church as possible on every mission trip. So just a reminder of that then, so to kind of look at how far we've come, even in a few months since, say, September, um, you know, we've been an attractional church for like 20 years. And by attractional, <coughs> that means um, get everybody to come in. Next weekend is the best weekend ever. Um, always trying to get people adding services, adding campuses in the region. And in this year, we're not just shifting. We have shifted, I think you figured that out, to an equipping church from being attractional, come come and see, to really rallying and then go and tell. So we're really in a place where the church has shifted to be an equipping church to make our church more missional and to have a kingdom mission, a great commission. And to illustrate, that I wanted to bring this up. Uh, this is something we, we uh, surveyed you on recently, back in September actually. Uh, what are words that come to mind when you think of kingdom of God? All right. So here's the, the biggest things you said back in September were people, love, heaven, peace, and holy. So after five months of hearing about the kingdom of God preached and seeing it demonstrated, my guess is you would have different answers today. Mm -hmm. They would not be so centric on what's happening right here amongst the body of Christ that meets in our local ecclesia or gathering of believers on a Sunday. And some of you know, some people hit some of those things on the outer edges, but the mass of people really were kind of thinking like, you know, it's it's what's happening right here, right here, right now. So um, 
And here's the thing. I think as the church has changed, you are changing too. I went when I first moved my family back from Ireland back to America two years ago, they still had little Irish accents. They still had the little things they liked from the Irish food. We had to keep going to the British Isle at Publix, just kind of keep them happy with their custards and their jammy dodges. And so they <laughs> like these little candies and cookies and stuff from Britain. Um, within two months, they were wearing paint camouflage and listening to Blake Shelton. You know what I'm saying? It, it didn't take long for them. If we changed, they changed with us. Uh, I'm like, I never changed. I was in the country music the whole time I was overseas. But as they got back into the environment, they couldn't help but change because in many ways, they were more moldable than we were to change. And because you're next generation, you're more moldable to change, especially when it comes to ecclesiology, than the average church goer. Then how church is done and, and what happens in church, these are such formative years for your life. You know, like if you're not 25 yet, your brain's not even fully developed yet. Use that one, your friend, later. Um, but So you're very moldable right now, especially in these early years of, of, of church. Even if you've been in church 25 years, these are still, your 20s is such a prime time in church in early 30s. So, so you've changed as the church has changed. So let's look at maybe how you've changed. What are some words now you would use to describe this season our church has been in since Passover? What are some words you would use to describe what's happened in the last eight months? Okay. Love to see some of these. Yeah. Try not to look up because you're done. Be good to see what what you're getting in your spirit. Any more people? What's interesting is, um, I didn't use the word kingdom of God, but what, what's happened in the past eight months is kingdom of God, yeah. right? Sure. So look at how these words are so different from what you just shared just a few months ago when you thought about what you were seeing in the kingdom of God, <coughs> your kind of vision for the kingdom of God, and how that's changed. I mean, the open heaven, demonstration, wholeness, priesthood. Kingdom minded. I mean, obviously, you're listening to the church on Sunday. That was awesome Sunday about demonstration. But do you see how the, the language has changed? Do you see how the words have changed? It's like you got a brand new dialect, brand new accent. In many ways, a very, almost a different language. And like I said, kids catch that faster than even the adults would in a family. So I bet if we ran into random congregant and ask some of the same stuff, they might come with some of the other stuff you shared a few months ago, but get some of this. But you're you're right on the pulse and heartbeat of what's happening in church. Would you agree? Yeah. I mean, you're right there on it. One body, authority, big moves, empowerment, sacred, freedom, priesthood, family, sanctified, Shabbat, horizontal salvation, encounter, divine appointments, new wineskin, restoration, thin veil, pledge loyalty. Pastor Stowell is going to love this stuff. So uh, it looks great. So let's discuss a few major paradigm shifts that have happened that have kind of led to some of this language really becoming real. 
All right? You've heard this one, right? In the last few months, probably not before very much, unless you came from a very Pentecostal or charismatic background. Five-fold ministry. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teacher. Um, so we are we have stepped into a season of embracing the fivefold ministry paradigm. It's not something someone just made up one day. It's in Scripture. Uh, it's in Ephesians chapter four, and we're going to go to that in just a moment. But fivefold ministry, and kind of for purposes to go forward the rest of my time here talking to you guys, um, apostle, prophet. Evangelist, shepherd, teacher, that's APEST, A P E S T. I'll use this five. And we sat in today, before this class, we sat in a spirit, spiritual gifts workshop with Pastor Brian Schwartz. He didn't really discuss this. He discussed the gift of prophecy, but he did not discuss the offices, the spiritual offices here of the fivefold ministry, but they work hand in hand. I would say they work hand in hand like a football team. Um, you know, like everybody on a football team, might have some strength, some speed, some technique, some smarts, some strategy, but they're not all using them in the same way. Matter of fact, some running backs in football, they make their living on running faster than everyone else. But some running backs make their living, even though they're a running back, they make their living on being more elusive, maybe juking and jiving, or maybe they make their living on running people over because they're very strong and big. So the idea is the office is the position, but how you play the position, what skills you have would be the spiritual gifts. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. So like I was, a, I was an offensive lineman for Air Force back in, back in the, the prehistoric age of the 90s, um, and I was an offensive guard. Uh, I liked, I had technique, I had quick feet, still, still, still have some quick feet now. And, uh, and I had, you know, but I was a little smaller than a lot of the guys that were like six foot six, 380 pounds, but I would be, I would have some technique, I would have some skill, I'd have some meanness and nastiness, I would have like, when I played football, I would have like saliva on my jersey from like just growling people. Uh, so I became a different person with the ball field, it was beautiful. So I had my office, you know, but I also had the way that I, the way that I worked that out, the gifts, so to speak, to work with that, so you might, you might find yourself at some point realizing, you know what, I, mean, I have the office on me of shepherd, but uh, I have a gift of tongues. So I use that in what I'm doing as a shepherd. Or you might find yourself, you have the gift uh, of being an evangelist, but you might have the spiritual gift of um, a faith. So that's how you approach being an evangelist. Not every evangelist has the same spiritual gifts. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, so is this helping? We're on? Yeah. Okay, I don't see any question marks or uh, thumbs up. So, um, I, I'm looking for adoration all the time. <laughs> so, it's all good. I love having that kind of stuff. So. Um, all right, so we're embracing a form of the five-fold ministry concept. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4. So if you look at the whole chapter of Ephesians, um, especially 1 to 16, you're talking about Paul giving this dream for church, to the church at Ephesus. And he's saying he wants us unified, he wants us mature. But in the middle of that, he says, we have these offices. All right, so verse 7 of Ephesians 4, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. So everybody's been given grace. Look at the person next to you and say, you've been given grace. Yeah. All, right. All right, so, but then in verse 11, it says, on, so God's given us grace to have these spiritual offices in life. And he gave himself some of the apostles, so everybody's got grace. Some of those are to be apostles, some be prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. So that, that covers like 100% of Christians. Everyone has grace, and everyone falls in kind of one of these areas about how God is uniquely wired and gifted you for office. So and, it's, and there's a reason for it, and it, some of you put that on your answer for um, about what's happened in the past eight months, the equipping of the saints. Verse 12, this is where that's at in scripture. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Do you see how it doesn't say church is for the equipping of the saints? It says that the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers are given that gift, given those gifts for the equipping of the saints. 
So the equipping flows through apex. It flows through these spiritual gifts or spiritual offices. All right? Um, we've begun this. You've heard our pastor say that apostles, prophets, and even evangelists have been exiled. And, and the church has started to become run in most Western churches by um, teachers and shepherds or teachers and pastors. And so here's kind of a, a look at... Um, this is how Alan Hirsch puts it about Ephesians chapter 4. Verses 1 to 6 are about the unity of the church. And there's a unity of God. It's a grounding, it's a framework of orthodoxy. But then verses 7 to 11 show that the unity of the church is expressed through these people. It's expressed through us. It's expressed through you and me. It's expressed through apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers. And then it's for maturity. So it's, it's there for the end. It's for the maturity or the attaining the whole measure of fullness of Christ, the eventual goal for the maturity and equipping the saints, but it flows through these people, not just through pastors, not just through teachers, but through all these people. So this is what Pastor Stilwell talked about. If I can see, okay, all right. So you see way over the far left, the fractured ministry, shepherds and teachers. And then you see over here, here's the exiled ministries, that the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, prophets, they're, they're kind of off the side. They're kind of in hiding. And honestly, in our previous paradigm of church, in many ways, they were kind of relegated to January uh, to awakening to our prayer and fasting season or our freedom groups. Uh, that's kind of where you saw the energy heat up on some of that as opposed to most of the rest of the year. So, but notice what suffers when you drop these. Do you see what's suffering? The... Capacity to mature. Now it's incapacity to mature. The church can't mature without these offices being displayed. You also see what's what's hurting. The unity of the church. It's being damaged because you have this immaturity of believers starting to crumble <coughs> the foundations. It's a pretty powerful picture. When I said Pastor Stovall, he went crazy. Um, so that is kind of a picture of where a lot of megachurches are. Because a lot of this is not really demonstrated. All right? So of those five, A, B, E, S, T, of course, we think that shepherds and teachers, um, they get a lot of cred, credibility in today's church world. But which underlies spiritual office intrigues you the most? Apostle, prophet, evangelist. And by intrigue, I use that word because they've been so underrepresented, uh, underrepresented, or as Pastor Brian said today, misrepresented. Mm -hmm. You walk to downtown, downtown St. Augustine, the guy with the billboard on his on his shirt, and he's preaching and yelling at everybody. I would not call it evangelism. Um, I think he may have missed his office. Okay. Um, so I think, and a lot of folks can start to see. You'll catch some TV ministry and somebody has a church of 50 people and they're calling themselves an apostle. Again, a bit misrepresented to what apostle should be. All right, so you kind of see an, an, an uh, evenness on an apostle and prophet, very interesting stuff, and evangelist. And we don't, we're a very evangelistic church, so in some ways you're like, well, I'm pretty familiar with evangelism and what's going on there. All right, so I did a, I did a test. I, I wanted to see, like, where do I think I fit in this? So, um... So I did a test here to, um, to see where I was at. And so I landed, I took a test, it's 50 different questions. It took about five minutes. And it was like, uh, and you had to choose out of one of the two words, which one you identified with, or one of the two things. So I landed with <laughs> apostolic shepherding. Um, so it, it's funny. Um, Cause, so I thought it was funny because I've moved overseas before. Uh, I've, expand, I've been a part of seeing ARC expanded internationally in Celebration Church. I've moved back to be a missions pastor. Um, I can't wait to talk to people about missions and going out to pioneer in the world. And missions has like this little family. Missions, not mission nights, you know, a couple hundred people here and there. Um, the next one is on Tuesday. Love for you to show up here. Yeah. All right, We're so, um, for the trip. We like to view <laughs> missions night as a campus, you know, in a way. I'm like, this is our campus. We're overseeing these people for a season of their life. So the Apostle Shepherd is a humanizer of causes, mission, and purpose. I was just surprised at how like right on this thing was. 
Um, the impact of the apostle slash shepherd is to connect people to the broader translocal mission of the church. How much could they have done? Uh, driven by a broader vision, they have a high EQ to miss that one. They're able to lead people without losing them on the journey. It was pretty cool. So they live well in the tension between staying and going. I'm always like, where's my passport? I'm about to leave next week. I don't even know. Um, so it, it hit the nail on the head for me. I was really amazed by that. Um, here's a couple other things that it said. Uh, some ways knowing my office can help me. Here's some things I can impact. I can cast vision of people around me. Thank you. I need to do it more often. Uh, those nearest to me are likely to have an apostolic or even a prophetic mindset because I need a little bit of prophetic mindset speaking into me so that I can have clearer vision. Uh, what you see as needed to further a missional cause may not be immediately seen by those around you. Yeah, sometimes I see ahead uh, futuristic some of my gifts. So I'm using this as an example. Uh, I was, you know, as the shepherd, I was like, man, I was kind of hoping like apostolic super preachers of the nations, but it's okay to kind of have, it's, the church needs shepherds. Um, so, and then on the shepherd part, the one who cares, I can provide a comfortable yet challenging space for people. Reagan's like, yeah, right? Uh, you naturally see potential progress and growth. Um, people feel comfortable running because you naturally understand their feelings, emotions, and life situations. Uh, they come to you for help, advice, comfort, and pay cups. So, you know, you, you kind of see that. So, like, this test nailed me on the head. I'm like, man, it got me. So that's just a that's just a, a glimpse into some of the one of the things that's happened in our church's ecclesiology uh, going forward. Now, how we navigate this movement, this movement towards our church being equipping, this movement with our church now with apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers, trying to find uh, a unity working together. Um, and so it's a shifting. If you look at the book of Acts. People like to say, I like to go back to the early church, man. I'm part of the early church. So they're talking about Jerusalem. Jerusalem, though, was a pretty interesting church. The Jerusalem model church, it was a homogenous, local, mega congregation. Start with 120, added 5,000 here, 3,000 here. So they had eight, more than 8,000 people within no time. They had legendary success. They were attractional. They kept trying to find buildings that would fit everybody, like Solomon's porch, right? And, unfortunately, it was short-lived. So Jerusalem had that kind of come, come and see. Let's all get together. Yes, there was stuff happening at homes, but there wasn't even diversity in race in the leadership. One of the first big things that happened in ministry of making the deacons and elders was to minister to other races so the apostles could do more studying and teaching. So Jerusalem didn't have it all figured out. But this is kind of one paradigm of church. It's kind of what your mega church model is. Now, celebrations never exactly fit this mold, but we have fit a lot of the methodologies that those churches would use. And like I said today in prayer when we were in, in there, it's kind of like a lake. It's rooted to a geographical location and it's waiting to receive from all the streams around it. But it is static. It's not on the move, so much to speak. So that's that's one of the uh, models of church you see in the book of Acts. The, the, the next one is one you probably don't catch, but it's talked about more than any other early church in the New Testament. Um, it's the church of Antioch. Because this is the church that Paul left out of in Barnabas. This is the church that every missionary journey Paul would come back to at the end. This is the church where he's discipled and sent out. So this church is like Antioch in Syria. So this church is a multi-ethnic missional congregation. They're the first ones that were ever called Christians. Remember that in the book of Acts? In Antioch, Antioch that's the first place they were called Christians. Little Christ. It was Paul's sending church. They were congregational, but they were also very missional they had a regional and far-reaching influence. They were innovative. They didn't have the advantage of having been the center of worship for the last over a thousand years like Jerusalem had been. Antioch was not the center of worship for anything to do with Yahweh. But it became, it became the center for sending out. Antioch's like your church is not obsessed over seating capacity. They're obsessed over sending capacity. All right, So they're wanting to send out. 
and we're kind of, this is where we shifted. This is where we moved towards because look at the next thing. They're like a river. Antioch's like a river. It's always flowing outward and it's always moving. So when I said when you go on a mission trip, it's like you're having to take off from an aircraft carrier and it's already moving. It's already deployed. The church is already moving. If you're gone for two months like Tony and Mary Joy, you better keep up because who knows what's going to change in two months. All right? So it's a river. It's always, always flowing. So thinking about missional, this is what you said a few months ago, I think in October. What are three words that come to your mind when you think of missions? All right, so again, if my, what I'm thinking goes true, you've changed even faster than the average congregant. You've changed with the church changing. All right, so just a few months ago, you were like, missions is love, serving, church, faith, needs, sacrifice. Kind of the biggest thing. So that was three words that came to your mind when you thought of missions just a few months ago. Um, but as the paradigm has shifted, as the church has shifted, you know, what are three changes you have, you've observed in this transition? All right? What are some things you've observed? In, what are some things you've seen change in this transition? Yeah, you can, in the whole church. What are some things you've observed? So give you more than one word. You can put three one. Give you a couple words. Okay, good. There's a limit of like 25. Yeah, okay, cool. So you put a couple things down. What are three changes you observed in this transition in church, our ecclesiology, how the church is operating? For instance, you know, Friday nights. Yeah. <laughs> Everything. Thank you. <laughs> so, thanks, Sam. That had to be you. So. All right. I gave you a couple minutes for that. You can use a couple words if you need to. Spirit led everything <coughs> sent out. Shabbat made a comeback at the end there. Worship, equipping, perspective, pastors' messages. Taking <laughs> <coughs> back to home, perspective, Holy Spirit flow, emphasis on together, praise from the heart, reverence towards God. Again, I was talking about. What do you think of when you think of missions? <coughs> I'm asking you now. And so here, a few months later, you're talking about what you're seeing happen in church. Like I said earlier, our missions needs to flow out of what's happening in our church. So how missions should look should flow out of this. We're a river, not a lake. All right? So we should, the tributaries feeding into this river are all of these things. And so now in the river, as we go forward, missions, hopefully in a few months you start to say, that's what you think of when you think of missions. Spirit-led. Worship. Sent out. Shabbat. So it's, it's a huge help to our department because we're trying to figure out how should missions look. We're not going to be a church than a church. We want, again, to represent or represent our church. So this is the stuff we need to represent on and from our department, on your mission trip, and whatnot. Good stuff, right? Good. Yeah. All right. All right, so as scary as it's been, we could probably say this is a needed move for our church. Um, I was just reading today that every year 
Between six and ten thousand churches in America close. Between six and ten thousand churches in America close every year. That's a lot of churches that are dying. I was riding down a highway with a friend of mine in Europe a couple of years ago, and he was involved in a big mega church like ours. And I just asked him, I said, Man, when are things gonna change? I can feel my spirit. It's like it's only gonna work for so long being like, let's see a movie and then change it into a sermon series. And we'll do some messages that are cool and somebody will wear skinny jeans. You know what I'm saying? Like, that only works as a methodology certain places for so long. And um, so the, the move was needed. Here's what uh, Tom Rainier said in Autopsy of the Deceased Church. It says 6,000, 10,000 are dying a year. And the answer for all of them is not relevancy. Yeah, they need to get up to speed, but it's life, it's breath. They need breath. So here's what some things he saw in the autopsy of, of deceased churches. Things they said, going through the motions, stuck in a rut, bad routine, more attached to the ways of doing church than asking the Lord what he wanted, playing a game called church, afraid to ask what we should do in fear it would require too much effort or change. This is lake mentality. We're not changing. We're static. We've always done it this way. We're always going to do it this way. So, um, some pretty sobering stuff, but that's how churches that are dying are thinking. So I wouldn't say we were dying. I don't think any of us would say that. But we're definitely alive, more alive now than we were eight months ago. All right? So here's the shift to missional. The shift is we're sent into the world by a missionary God representing him in every domain, in every place. So this is what we're pitching to our congregants, right? That we're, God's mobilized us. He's made us into a priesthood of all believers. And the church itself is moving towards being something that's not just come, come to church, come to church, come to church. No, it's go out and be the church. Let's take stuff off our calendar. Let's clear our calendars at church. Let's stop doing conferences. Let's make stop all the Friday night stuff at church. Everyone go home and pray over your home. Take communion. And be sent out. Minister to your neighbors in your, in your community. It's, it's fascinating. Okay. A couple more things. Um, so, if, so that shift from attractional to missional. Since God is a missionary God, the church is a sent people. We see Jesus is the model of mission. God sent Jesus to the earth. That's how God sends people. All right, so uh, let's get practical for a minute. Uh, this is something you answered recently. Have you been on a mission trip before? And about half of you had not been on an international mission trip. So here, as we go in talking about this summer, we're going to see 100% of people go on an international mission trip. Uh, so here's a question for you. How much money have you raised for your mission trip? Zero dollars? One to 250? 251 to 750? 751 to 1500, 1501 plus. I feel like the price is right. I'm bidding. One dollar. <coughs> 1502. Just want to help you. Because you've been working on awakening, you've been working on all kinds of stuff. We're about to get to work. We're we'll money for missions. All right? So, roughly half of the people have not raised one dollar yet. That means God has a lot of room to move, right? Amen? Come on. Yeah. A lot of room to move. Okay. And, uh, and Ann should coach all of us on how to raise money for missions. Yeah, apparently. So yeah, Ann. Yeah. One plus. All right. Cool. We've got to move on. A couple of you may have left. That's right. All right. Okay, let's do this. How do you feel about raising your mission trip funds? I believe I can do this. Give it a little rating. One, one is strongly disagree, five is strongly agree. Give a rating for each thing. You know, have you given maximum effort? You know, have you used the in the box methods? Have you written a couple letters? Have you um, done some social media posts? The things, people start, sometimes they think out of the box. Like, I'm gonna make t-shirts. I'm gonna sell <coughs> Kool-Aid. You know, you kinda sell Kool-Aid and get money. I'm gonna wash cars. Those aren't in the box. In the box methods are right there. And um, the, the social media posts, using your link, doing letters and whatnot. 
and then I need help coaching for fundraising. Five more minutes, and then we'll go to back and break. Okay. Five more minutes. All right. Okay, so that's real helpful. So we see that the faith level's getting there. Four point five. That's good. Uh, the effort has not been there. In the box methods has not been there. And people do need help with coaching. Greg, I'll be giving this to you later. All right. I'm gonna download it. All right. Two last things. All right, so we said we started, go and abide. When we go, there is a time we go out and then we settle and abide. Even on your seven-day mission trip to where, like my seven-day mission trip to Haiti, we went to Haiti, I unpacked my stuff, and every outreach I was in, I tried to abide. Every outreach, I'm like, I want to try to find a place here where I can sit, get still listen to God, and plant some seeds, and see where I naturally <coughs> and supernaturally can fit in the situations. That's great. How can I abide? We were at a place, and the, the girls were, were um, the ladies, I was on a mission trip with eight ladies, uh, six of them were single moms, uh, it was a great team, um, and they were awesome, but they were doing BBS stuff for kids. They had it all planned out. I didn't need to help with that piece. And I just kind of was like, all right, God, I need to do, I mean, I'm the, I'm the missions pastor. I just can't be beating over here watching and taking pictures of people serving. And I'm like, God, what do you want me to do right now? And then the missionary kept me and was like, hey, I want to introduce you to a, to a kid. That's pretty natural. I mean, I pray, the missionary comes to me. So he takes me over to a kid, and the kid's blind. He's 17. So I just sit down with him and start talking to him. He doesn't know a ton of English. We do okay. But then I find out he likes Bob Marley. So I pull out my cell phone. I find some Marley on there. I find some Wiz Khalifa. Before long, I'm like, we're singing Wiz Khalifa Fast and the Furious songs together in Haiti for like 30 minutes. It was a chance to abide. You know? And so, um, so the sea takes ground. You get pushed down into a culture for a few days. And then, let's see what grows out from within that. Missions? Cross-cultural ministry, incarnational ministry like Jesus himself. He came to earth, he found a place, he grew in it, and then he ministered naturally out of that. Right? So that is abiding. In some ways, it's more difficult than going out. Because it's pioneering. It's difficult, it's work, and it's necessary. But it's, it's not as exciting as getting on an airplane. It's not as exciting as crossing borders. It's not as exciting as, in some ways, even as fundraising. But it's in the moment. And it's, if you think about the pioneers who went across America, they would go to a certain place, stop, build a town. Then they would branch out from there. And that's how the kingdom of God grows, too. The people of God go out, settle down, grow, then go out again. One guy calls it the sneeze effect. It goes out, it goes down, it goes out again, it goes down. All right? Why is this important? Why, why is abiding so important? Why is it important to gauge the world in that way? Why is it important to be the authentic self that you are? Why is it important to... to and, and what is a... I have an illustration to show how important it is because in December, this is what you said about the temptation to compromise your faith. See, the enemy doesn't want you being your authentic self. In Christ. He wants you polluted, toxified. He wants you losing courage and boldness. He wants you feeling condemnation. He doesn't want you being your genuine self. He doesn't want you settling down. He wants you, if, if the missionary asks you, hey, come meet this blind kid, he wants you to say, I can't do that. Two weeks ago, I had this, this thing I got into, this sin. Okay, so that's why the enemy is hurling darts at you, right? Because God just wants you to be genuine. So the power of Christianity is you're an agent of the king. You're an agent of the king. And your sins, past, present, and future are dealt with on the cross. The abiding is where the Holy Spirit shows up in powerful ways. Again, 
We talked about last month how real the temptation was to quit, quit the college. And half the people in the room felt like there was a, a significant temptation, at least half, like 50% temptation just to quit. It, was, it wasn't half, it was 13, 15, 15 versus 24. So it was still quite significant. And no judging on anybody that's not here or anything like that. Everybody has life stuff going on. But you are some of the same people. This is what Francis Chan said. By myself, I can only speak of God's love. With others, I had the opportunity to actually show love, forgiveness, and patience. Rather than just hearing about Jesus, people can actually get a glimpse of him. This is you on your mission trip. Rather than just hearing about Christians, they get to meet you. Wow. They get to spend time with you. They get to see the joy of the Lord as your strength. And like Pastor Brian said, spirit on you for them, right? That, that gets to happen for you. Just hearing about Jesus, people can actually get a glimpse of it. So where's my place in all this? You're in the place of preparation right now. And the church is, has shifted around quite a bit. A few months ago, we asked three years from today, where do you think you'll be vocationally? Like, how are vocations going to work out of this future season of church? Um, and 14 wanted to be at our church, or a family <coughs> church, working on staff. At least 11 wanted to be at some staff somewhere. Nine wanted to work at a Christian ministry or mission, so you had 20, 34, and only seven people like looking at other things, all right? So a lot of people interested in Christian ministry and mission. So the key, the key is going to be how can you go, then abide, and then repeat over and over and over again. Right now, preparation, it's an abiding time. But there will be a going time. And then when you go, you're going to abide. And you'll have to go again. But it's in each of those stages that God's going to help you. And the last question I wanted to ask you, um, how many of you would like to take a four to five minute test about apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, or teacher? Vote it up. Is there a, oh, it's just thumbs up, okay. Because so, um, we can purchase those. And, and what we'll do, it's like what most, what one does not, one's like, I ain't got none of that. So, yeah. Way to go, Corey. Um, okay, so what we're going to do then, next time we have practicum with you guys, we're going to take the test, all of us. Bring your laptop next time missions is here. You'll have the four to five minute test, then you'll get the download of what, how it fits for you. So we'll have a few minutes to process that together, and you'll begin this. Now, don't like going on your mission trip and be like, I'm the prophet, y'all. I got the piece of paper. I'm the apostle, Pastor Stovall. Move over. You know what I'm saying? But it's good to know, like, what's in your heart now. Okay? Good stuff. Thank you guys for tuning in.